Okay, so our exam four, which is our next exam, which will be on May 14th, so in a couple of weeks, um, because it's going to be on just muscular system. Um, it seems really soon, <laughs> but um, it's just the muscular system. Um, it's not like skeletal and joints the way that our last exam was. It's just muscles, it's microscopic muscles, and then like name the muscles. I'm looking, I was looking through it today um, and, and all this weekend, what exactly it is that we're going to be covering um, based on like what Wiley Plus has and what your lab manual shows and like what we have with the coloring book and our textbook. And um, I don't want to like, I don't want you guys to like rest on your laurels or anything, but I really kind of feel like the skeletal system was the hardest, I think that was the hardest section. I think that was, I think that was the peak. I think that was the peak of difficulty. Um, this next section with the muscular system, um, there are some parts that are weird, but I feel like it's really not as bad um, as the skeletal system in terms of like the volume of information. So not to like, you know, give you guys a false like <laughs> sense of security. I want you guys to have a sense of security, um, but I just feel like this is gonna be a little bit more relaxed and then we'll have exam four. It'll be all the same format as we have the last two exams. Um, and then we're going to study the eye and the ear. Um, and then the final is just, the finals are just going to be on that. So the lab final is going to be um, same format pictures of just eye and ear stuff. And the lecture final will be questions that I pull from the eye and ear chap the special senses chapter in the textbook specifically. Um, so no cumulative finals. Um, skeletal system was gnarly. It's a gnarly, it's a gnarly chapter. And I always like, I don't know why I felt like the muscular system was hard to, but looking through it, I'm like, mm, compared to what we just have been through, I just don't think it's that, I just don't think it's as bad. And so let me like totally like shake you guys up again by diving into this because the hardest part of a muscular system is the muscle tissue part okay so it's this so what we're going to talk about today and i want to only talk about this today we're just going to talk about the microscopic um how muscles work uh type of thing today and not even get into muscles and their actions and stuff until thursday um i'm not going to start on any of that stuff until thursday for today i just want to talk about muscle tissue how muscles work, like the muscle physiology aspect, which I think is the weirdest part. Um, so I, wanna, I want you guys to have exposure to it right away so that it's like gonna have been sitting in your mind for the longest before the exam. So there is no lab um, that I have for you, like specifically for today's stuff. There's no lab for today's stuff. The labs that I'm going to, um, that I'm going to assign, the stuff that I'm going to assign for our muscular system labs will have to be the, um, from the coloring book, since obviously we're not doing a dissection. Um, so the, uh, all of that dissection stuff in the lab manual, um, it's interesting reading, but um, it's, not, it's not as useful as it would have been if we were actually, like, actually looking, at a dissect, looking at dissecting a small animal. So I have a question. Go for it. I, is this the right book? That's the, exactly the book. Yes. Because <laughs> I ordered it. I wanted to make sure it was right. Yeah. Well. It is, it's so beautiful. I'm so happy about it. I know. It's so beautiful. There's actually some really great pages on the muscular system. So they've got the, yeah. a whole chapter on the muscular system. We've got like all of the muscles named and defined yes, yes, yes. even like the actions are on this as well which is pretty sweet and then all of the weird crap that we're going to talk about today is all here on pages uh 56 and 57. so um i know that's not everybody has this not everybody has purchased this so i think i'll um i'll scan this for whoever wants it email me if you want this this isn't anything different from what's in your actual textbook um it's just another it's just another perspective so if you feel like you've looked at the textbook and it still doesn't make sense, uh, email me and I will send you a scanned copy of this. Um, and that way, um, maybe for whatever reason, this clicks for your brain in a way that the other things don't, you know, it happens. 
sometimes you just need that one extra alternate viewpoint um, for something to click. So the rest of it is what I'm going to assign for the actual muscular system labs, <clears throat> which is just like the same type of like labeling and coloring, but instead of skeletal elements, it'll be muscles. So they've got it, they've got it divided into body parts, same way. So like all of the, the labs, we just take a picture and send it in. Yep, same thing. Let me, um, let me upload the, um, the, uh, the assigned pages uh, for everybody so that you see exactly which page, pages go with which lab um, before you upload anything. So that I have um, all the same pages from everybody for, for each lab. It makes it a lot easier for me grading it. So yeah, so no lab assignment um, for like tonight. I'll assign the first lab thing on Thursday. Um, and for today, let's dive into the uh, muscle physiology. So specifically, how muscles work on a microscopic level, which is, it's so cool, you guys. It's just seems, it's just gonna seem a little bit overwhelming at first, um, but once it clicks, it's really neat how this all works. So let's get into it. For um, skeletal, so we're talking about skeletal muscle, right? We have, we talked about three different types of muscle tissue and we talked about his, uh, histology. We talked about skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle, right? So we talked about the skeleton and now we're talking about those muscles that move your skeleton around, okay? So what we're, gonna, what we're talking about here, um, it is, some of it is the case um, with cardiac muscle in particular, but what we're talking about here is very specific for just skeletal muscle, okay? So this is just the muscles that move your skeleton around and that you have conscious control over, right? So each one of your muscles, every one of your like whole muscles is served by a single nerve and a single artery, right? Feeding it nutrients and one or more veins, which are going to be um, removing waste products, right? So in this image, uh, this one I found on the internet uh, is the only thing that I could show that, that I could find that really showed that um, there's just one great big nerve serving this whole muscle, right? So it does have these, it does have branches, right? And it branches off to serve all the different um, little parts of the muscle so that your whole muscle contracts at the same time, ideally, right? Um, and then you've got one artery that branches off and uh, feeds all of the different parts of the muscle, and then um, one vein in this picture, right, which is going to be carrying the waste products away from the muscle. Okay, so we're going to talk about, we're going to like basically like be diving into smaller and smaller like subunits of the muscle, and they have their own names. It's kind of bizarre. Um, this is just, I, I stuck this in here just so that you guys could sort of like start to get an idea. I was talking about how the nerve branches off and um, basically interacts with every little tiny part of the muscle. This is just a cartoon basically of like at the very end of one of those branches, right? You would have the end of one axon serving one muscle cell, okay? So this would be like that last axon at the end of that uh, branch of the nerve that's feeding the muscle and it talks to uh, the muscle cell. Um, so every muscle cell um, is interacts with some part of that nerve, that main nerve that feeds the muscle, okay? This is all looking a little weird right now. we will make more sense in a few minutes. What I'm going to do first is name the characters, okay? So I'm going to be throwing a lot of weird words at you, um, <laughs> and I'm just going to be like, naming the different parts and I'm not going to talk about how they all work until towards the end because it's not going to make sense unless you know who all the characters are okay so it's like um, starting a new uh, tv show right you gotta like introduce all the characters first and then the story comes after that so these three guys are um they're kind of familiar in terms of what they are these are um connective tissue sheets um, and I know that we've talked about um, connective tissue sheaths on bone, right? Uh, the periosteum. Um, there is a perichondrium on cartilage, uh, but we haven't, we didn't really talk about that. And on muscle, we have an epimysium, okay? So osteum is muscle, um, chondrium is cartilage, 
and mesium is muscle, okay? And this sheath is the epimesium, so it is the one that covers the, out, the complete outside of the muscle, okay? Kind of like how the periosteum, periosteum covers the entire bone, right? Or almost the entire bone, right? The, um, the epimesium is the outer part of the muscle. The perimesium covers um, some of the bundles of muscle fibers within that muscle, okay? We'll talk about more that more in a bit. Um, and then the endomesium covers even smaller bundles of fibers, okay, within that muscle. So the epimesium covers the whole big outer part. The epimesium covers um, like these slightly smaller subunits within the larger muscle. And the endomesium covers little tiny bundles within those smaller bundles within the larger muscle, okay? Stay with me. <laughs> here's a picture to try and clarify that, okay? So here's the epimesium covering this entire muscle. So this looks like a femur to me, right? There's the big round head of the femur and the neck, the tendon attaching to that, um, looks like the that lesser um, trochanter right there. We've got, the, uh, so this is gonna be, this could be somebody's like quadricep muscle or something, right? So the big fat muscle on the front of your upper leg. So you've got the whole big muscle, right? And the outer part of it is covered by the epimesium, right? So this is connective tissue that is covering this. And that connective tissue actually is going to form that tendon at the end of the at the end of the muscle where it actually connects or attaches to the bone that point of attachment right there so knowing that this is like the same type of connective tissue mostly um, as a tendon then we know that that is going to be dense regular connective tissue if you recall from histology right so this is a dense regular connective tissue and at the very end of the muscle it actually forms that tendon um, which is the point of attachment for that muscle to the bone, whatever bone it attaches to. In this big muscle, you can see the little, all the various branches of the arteries and veins a little bit, kind of like interspersed throughout here, right? Um, so the whole muscle gets fed, um, but there is one main artery and vein that comes down and like um, is, the, is the parent to all of these little branches of it, right? That's feeding the entire muscle. Okay, so you've got the muscle covered by epimesium. Within the muscle, you have kind of smaller subunits, okay? So if each one of these um, sort of weird oblong guys is one of those subunits, and you pulled one out right here, this is kind of what it would look like. And it's a bundle of these guys. And it is covered by the perimesium. Okay, so this is the epimesium, and then throughout here, you've got the paramecium. So you know how when you cut into like a steak, and you, um, and you cut um, like against the grain of the steak, and there's like, there's sometimes, there's, there's like marbling, right? Like look at this, it's totally like marbling like a steak. That's the connective tissue, that's the, um, the connective tissue sheets of the, um, the bundles of tissue inside of the muscle, okay? So the epimesium is like that weird um, sort of like spider webby fascia that covers the outside of the edges of the stake. Um, and then the paramecium is kind of like some of that white stuff that's happening like, with, like inside of the stake. So what we call this bundle and each of these little bundles here, is a fascicle, okay? So the muscle is made up of fascicles, and the muscle is covered by the epimesium, while fascicles are covered by paramecium. And fascicles are made up of bundles of muscle fibers, okay? So this is one muscle fiber, and a bundle of muscle fibers is called a fascicle, and a bundle of fascicles is the muscle, okay? The muscle is covered by the epimesium, fascicles covered by the paramecium, and each muscle fiber is covered with endomesium, okay? Muscle, epi, fascicle, 
peri and muscle fiber endomesium. Okay, any questions so far? How are we doing? A little confused, but we're going. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's a lot. It's just, it's a lot of words, right? Um, different words for different things. Are you clear on like mesium being a connective tissue covering? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Epi is the outermost. Peri is in is sort of inside of that, covering this weird subunit of muscle. And then endo is the innermost, covering that innermost subunit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's basically it. All right. So let's Oh, here's a nice, here's a really pretty picture, actually, of, an, of, a, of a muscle fiber, um, sort of like slightly shredded here, which is what happens when you work out, right, or you uh, otherwise exercise intentionally or unintentionally. It's, the, it's this kind of damage to your muscle fibers that triggers um, the cells there to build more muscle fibers so that you, like, you end up growing your muscle, right? Um, so it repairs this. So what you're looking at here in this in this really neat picture um, is this um, right here, this whole muscle fiber. So this muscle fiber and all these little guys, all these little round tubes, all these funny little tr tubes in here are all of these fibers in here. Okay, so this is one of those muscle fibers. And when you bundle them up together like this, you have a fascicle, and when you bundle a bunch of fascicles up together, you get the whole muscle. This is actually a, I think that just is, a, I think that's actually a scanning electron microscope image. That's very cool. It's in color too. Awesome. Anyway, I thought that was neat. It's in your textbook too, so check it out. And then this image, I just wanted to um, give you guys one more view of this to see if this made any more sense to you um, and to zoom in one additional layer. So basically what we were looking at, sorry, we were looking at here, this muscle fiber right here, that is going to be this whole thing right here, okay? So these tiny, all these tiny little tubes right here, we're basically zooming in, we're gonna pull one of those guys out now, okay? So we're going even further. Your muscle is like tubes on tubes on tubes. So one step further, the actual parts of the muscle fiber are gonna be these guys right here, okay? So these, um, these little components of the entire muscle fiber are what are actually the, con the, the smallest contractile unit of your muscle. So this is where the actual contraction takes place. All of these little tubes inside of the muscle fiber itself, they all contract, which causes the muscle fiber to contract, which means the fascicle contracts, which means your muscle contracts, okay? Um, the muscle fiber, when I use the term muscle fiber, that is interchangeable with a muscle cell. So a muscle cell, or muscle fiber, same thing, totally interchangeable, um, is a cell, even though, it's, it's it, even though it contains all of these really weird structures um, called myofibrils, more on that in a bit, and, uh, but it also contains, you can see some mitochondria here, right? It's got its multiple nuclei, right? Because skeletal muscle is multinucleated, remember? So you've got multiple nuclei in this muscle cell, you've got your mitochondria, and you even have your endoplasmic reticulum, which in this case serves a very special purpose, which we're going to talk about. So um, yeah, this um, covering, this is going to be the, um, that um, endomesium right? No, this is going to be the endomesium right here because this is the bundle of muscle fibers, right? So um, yeah, this is a muscle cell. Muscle cell full of these weird little fibers that actually are the smallest contractile units of muscle contraction. All right, so let's talk about some more players here. Let's get some more characters out of the way. Um, so describing a muscle fiber, which is, again, a muscle cell, they are cylindrical, they are uh, uber tiny, right, 10 to 100 micrometers, micrometers, 
in diameter and up to 30 centimeters long. Okay, so that's actually, that's actually pretty long. Um, but they're very long, it's very, very skinny. You have multiple nuclei, right? Because this is skeletal tissue, skeletal uh, muscle tissue has, is multinucleated. You also have many mitochondria, big surprise, right? The powerhouse of the cell, you probably wanna have a lot of those in your muscles, right? Which is where you're gonna like be uh, producing power for motion. You also have glycosomes where you're gonna be storing um, sugar and uh, for energy, right? So when you, uh, so remember glycogen uh, is um, sugar. We're going to be storing sugar, uh, which is gonna be our form of energy that we're going to use in order to use our muscles. Um, and then myoglobin, which is a protein that stores oxygen gas, right? So that we can, or oxygen, um, so that we can feed those um, mitochondria when they do our um, cellular respiration, right? So cellular respiration and energy production are, um, and energy storage are super critical for muscles, right? Because you need a lot of energy to move your muscles around, right? So um, all of this is important. Some other players that we're gonna talk about are gonna be the, uh, the myofibrils, which I introduced back here. The, sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the weird and special name for the endoplasmic reticulum of muscle cells. More on that in a bit. And T-tubules, which are a very super specialized part of muscle cells, um, which again, we will talk about in a little bit because um, they don't really make much sense without some of the other stuff making sense first. So let's look at one of these guys okay this is gonna professor, be professor i have a question really quick sure. actually i'm sorry no for it no go for it so you said the contractile units of um the muscle mm -hmm. is that so is this in every single muscle like is this where contractions happen exactly yeah so every single skeletal muscle in your body um is um composed of all of these elements so they're they're all composed of fascicles, which are made of muscle fibers, which are your muscle cells. And every muscle fiber, <clears throat> which looks like this, has these myofibrils, is what they're called, inside. And it is actually this like these lines in here. This is actually all protein happening in here, and it interacts in such a way that um, these myofibrils contract in length, right? They shorten in length, which causes the entire muscle to shorten in length. Yeah, so that's how your all of your muscles contract. Do a dance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. All right. So myofibrils okay this is within the muscle cell okay so this is the um this is a muscle fiber aka muscle cell remember same thing muscle fiber muscle cell same thing it is multinucleated there are mitochondria in here there's that special endoplasmic reticulum in there and uh, in addition because muscle cells are highly specialized and pretty weird they have these other structures that fill their interior um, that are called myofibrils, okay? So each one of these is a myofibril. They are densely packed and rod-like, as you can see. They take up 80% of the cell volume. So the vast majority of, of what's inside of a muscle cell is these rods of myofibrils, okay? All this densely packed myofibrils. The myofibrils are where the striations of muscle tissue come from. So you've got these perfectly aligned repeating bands happening on every single myofibril. You've got little dark bands, which are called A bands, which are like basically like the darker stripes here, and lighter colored I bands, which are the lighter colored stripes that you kind of can see here, okay? So here's another image kind of saying, every, like kind of recapping what I just said. So mitochondria, nuclei, but myofibrils taking up the vast majority of this muscle cell. The plasma membrane of a muscle cell also has a special name. It's called the sarcolemma, 
okay? So that's just a special name for the plasma membrane of the, um, of the muscle cell. I should actually probably just put that in for you guys, huh? Plasma membrane. I'll re-upload this as per usual. I always find things when I'm actually lecturing on it. Okay. All right. So the plasma membrane has a special name, sarcolemma. The muscle fiber or, my, or uh, muscle cell is weird because it contains all of these myofibrils, okay, which are the little contractile units um, of the muscle itself. A bands are the dark stripes. I bands are the light stripes. Okay. All right. So with so in these little myofibrils, we're going to go one step deeper, and we're going to look at these little sets of lines in here. Okay. And these little sets of lines on each myofibril and within each myofibril. Okay. So this isn't just like on the surface of this rod. It's throughout this rod. Okay are these little lines. And the lines are basically like strands of proteins, very specialized proteins. Each of those little sets of lines, that little pattern that we saw, is called a sarcomere, okay? So the sarcomere is the smallest possible singular, one single sarcomere is the smallest singular functional unit of a muscle fiber. So in the same way that an osteon was the smallest functional unit of bone, the sarcomere is the smallest functional unit of muscle, okay? So these are different, these are little regions on the myofibril and it's repeating, right? So here's a sarcomere, here's a sarcomere, here's a sarcomere. So they're repeating all the way down the length of every single myofibril, which fill every single muscle cell. So the Z disc part of the sarcomere is going to be basically the boundary between one sarcomere and the next sarcomere. Every sarcomere, all of those little lines are again composed of proteins called myofilaments, thick and thin myofilaments, okay? And those are the things that are actually causing the contraction to happen on a microscopic level. I'm going to have a picture here in a second. Bear with me. So on the sarcomere, again, this little liney thing in the myofibril, okay? I know this seems like really weird and abstract right now. Bear with me. Um, all these little lines are these little proteins. Um, they, have, they have specific names, and we actually name each region of that sarcomere um, so that we know that we're talking about the same little part of it. We talk about muscle contraction, okay? So the thick filaments of a sarcomere are the ones that run the entire length of the A-band. So basically, they are the reason for this dark line, okay? That's where the thick filaments are. The thin filaments run the length of the I-band and partway into the A-band. So the thin filaments are where this light stripe are where the I band is, okay? And they overlap a little bit with the A band as well. The Z disc is going to be proteins that anchor the ends of the thin filaments and connect the sarcomeres to each other by connecting each of those myofibrils to each other. So basically between every sarcomere, you're going to have a little Z disc, which is going to basically be where those thin filaments uh, attach to each other between one sarcomere and the next sarcomere, okay? So neighboring sarcomeres are attached at the Z-disc via their thin filaments, okay? The H-zone is where the filaments do not overlap, and the M-line is the center of the sarcomere. It's where the thick filaments attach in the middle. I know it sounds crazy. <laughs> Let's look at it in a picture. So here is our myofibril, okay? So that is this. We're looking at one of these up close right here, okay? So we've got our A band, remember, is the dark stripe, and that is going to be from here to here, roughly, on this sarcomere, right? So the Z discs, the Z-disc right here is this end of this sarcomere, and this Z-disc is this end 
of the same sarcomere. Okay, so this is one sarcomere right here. This is the one next to it on the right, and there's one next to it on the left. Partial, partial one, right? We cut it in, we cut into it here. But this is one complete sarcomere right here. And this is kind of a th like sort of a 3D depiction of um, what it looks like, um, sort of in real life. So the A band from here to here is the dark stripe. The I band from here to here and here to here is the light stripe. So notice that the I band includes uh, both ends of these two adjacent sarcomeres, right? Both, like it's got a little part of this sarcomere and this part of this sarcomere. Okay, so the I band is the light stripe that you see uh, in, the, in the muscle fiber. The Z disc, again, is the edges of one sarcomere. It's where these thin filaments attach to each other. Okay. And the M line is going to be right down the middle of the sarcomere because that is where these thick filaments attach to each other um, and come out from the center of the sarcomere. Okay. So the thick filaments in this picture are the red lines and the thin filaments are the blue lines, okay? Notice how they overlap, right? We talked about the, um, how the thin filaments run partway into the A-band. That's going to be right here. This is where they overlap, okay? All right, so if we look at this one sarcomere and we depict it in, for, in terms of the actual proteins, that, um, this, that these lines are trying to represent, okay? So the lines are representing proteins. Red are the thick filaments. Blue are the thin filaments. Let's look closer even. Is it possible? Yes, of course it's possible. Let's look a little bit closer, zoom in a little bit more, and see the sarcomere in terms of the actual proteins that it's made up of, okay? So here's the Z-disc on this end, right? It's supposed to be that. Here's the Z-disc on this end, it's supposed to be that. Here's our M-line going down the middle, right? And our thick filaments are still red, while our thin filaments are still blue, and we still have this area where they overlap, right? This is where that thin filament is overlapping with this thick filament, okay? These little guys are also considered thin filaments, but they have a, a special, a super special uh, purpose. They're called Titan filaments. Um, I don't think I mentioned them again uh, throughout this lecture, um, so don't worry about them too much. What we're gonna talk about mostly are the thin filaments that are blue in this picture and the thick filaments, which are red in this picture. And again, these are made up of specialized proteins. And it is the fact that these guys overlap um, that is the key to muscle contraction, okay? Pardon me. Okay. <clears throat> I would ask you if you have any questions about the sarcomere, and I am asking, can you think of anything, or are you just, like, the second option, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm trying to process all this. Oh. I'll keep going. Ball. Am I cutting out at all? Are we, are we getting a clear picture? Yeah, that's yeah. good. For me. I have a good. Oh, got a question? Yeah. Um, so what would be the best way to go about, uh, I guess, studying it in a way? Um, yeah. Like, you know how we would depict it like in a quiz would be, would it like the current picture that we're seeing now, would we see it the, like the one on the upper side or the one on the lower? You could see either, honestly, you could see either. Okay. You can't, you can, so if it's asking about where, if it's asking about the A band versus the I band or like the Z right. zone, like those questions, this is probably what the kind of image that you're going to be asked about versus like right. which one is the thick filament which one is the thin filament you'll probably see something like this which you could see something like this for that but um it wouldn't be as as useful as seeing something like this what i would do to yeah the lower one is a lot 
the lower one seems a lot more detailed and useful and clear. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But if you're looking at this, you're only seeing one sarcomere and then mm -hmm. you don't really get to see like, you don't really get a clear picture of the eye bands in particular. So like this right, right here is going to be basically like from here to wherever the thick filaments start over here. So like this is the eye uh, okay. over here, right? This is the A band where the thick filaments are here. Uh -huh. here. Um, but it is a little bit harder to define on something this zoomed in. You want to like come out a little bit to see that. What I do, what I did when I learned this was I literally redrew. I would redraw something like this. Honestly, it would be like, okay, here's the muscle. This is epimecium. Here's a fascicle. Paramecium. Here's a muscle fiber, aka muscle cell, uh, with the endomecium, and then pull out a single uh, myofibril which are these little guys, right? This guy, this guy, this guy, <laughs> and this guy, right? Um, and just like keep, like, just keep zooming in. You're basically just like zooming in layer by layer is what you need to do. Okay. Learning the different parts that you can see as you go down the different layers. Right. Okay, Ashley, really quick, can you go over what an I band and an A band is? Sure. So uh, when we look at the my or we look at the muscle, um, the muscle cell or the muscle fiber as a whole, or the muscle really as a whole, muscle tissue. Remember, it's striated. We learned that when we talked about the histology. It's striated. It's multinucleated, um, and it's voluntary. Those are like the main characteristics of skeletal muscle, right? So the reason we're going to talk about so what we're talking about now is the reason why skeletal muscle is striated, like what those striations actually are. And they are the patterns of proteins inside of the myofibrils that fill every muscle cell. So every muscle cell, it looks stripy, right? It looks striated, it looks stripy. The A band is the dark stripes and the I band is the light stripes. And what they actually are is the where the thick um, where the thick filaments are versus where the thin filaments are. So the thick filaments, because they're they're thicker and wider and heftier, um, they show up more and it looks more dense and dark. So it actually physically looks darker on this part of the myofibril, right? And therefore, all on the dark on all this all this line on the muscle cell looks dark because of those thick filaments, those thicker proteins. The I band, so that's the A band, right? Is where those thick uh, filaments are, where the dark stripe is, where the dark stripe shows up. And then the I band is where there's only thin filaments. So just where these blue, where the blue thin filaments are, okay? So just where these blue proteins are is considered the I band. And since they're very thin and not as densely packed, um, it shows up lighter when you look at the actual muscle cell, right? So it's, it would be like this little light stripe is the I band. Does that make sense? Yes, on that picture that we were just looking at when... Uh, this one? Uh, slide. Hold on. That one, yeah. I just couldn't yeah. figure it out. So it's the red one, and then the I band is the blue one. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Blue, okay. is, blue is thick filaments and red is thick filaments. That may not be true for every image that you find like on the internet or whatever um, in terms of like the color matching up with the thin versus the thick. Um, but the way that you will know is that the Z line is where the thin filaments meet from one sarcomere to the next sarcomere. Okay. So like the thin filaments from this sarcomere meet the thin filaments from this sarcomere at the Z disc, okay? And like ideally they will look thinner. <laughs> they will draw them as thin lines versus thick lines. I just can't guarantee that these ones will be blue and these ones will be red in every image that you see. Um, so um, don't let that alarm you and don't depend on that specific color scheme to identify these proteins. Okay. okay. And then the M line is where the A bands meet? Uh, the, yep. The, the M line is basically the center of the A band. 
which is where these thick filaments meet in the middle of the sarcomere. Okay, so this whole thing is the sarcomere. The A band is where the thick filaments are. In the middle of that A band is the M line. And then the I band, um, it, does over, it does kind of overlap two separate sarcomeres, right? Because it's where the thin filaments of one sarcomere meet the thin filaments of the other sarcomere. And everywhere where it's just thin filaments and they're not overlapping with the thick filaments, that's the I band. Um, this H zone um, is important, um, but it doesn't, it won't make much sense when I, if I describe it right now, um, but basically when these thin filaments in blue overlap with the thick filaments in red like this, that H zone is going to get smaller. Ugh, it's so hard to describe from this. Um, so like this little zone right here will get smaller as these um, thin, these blue lines come in closer together and at the same time they're overlapping with these red with these red lines right here. So that will make more sense in a minute. I, I have a video, I actually have a video to show you guys um, that kind is of it contractions. So like when they contract, that contract zone gets smaller. Is the thin filaments overlapping with the thick filaments. That's how the muscle um, fiber, that's how the myofibril gets shorter, is by overlapping, these overlapping um, proteins. So it's really, it's really cool. And I have a video that I'm hoping will make everything crystal clear or um, more clear <laughs> when we get there. And I know you guys will have lots of questions, so I will be here. I'm here for that too. So interrupt me at any time. Anything else before I continue, we're gonna, we're gonna just like, we're gonna talk a little bit more about these proteins now, the thick and the thin filaments, okay? All right, so again, here we are with our thick filaments still in red and our thin filaments still in blue, okay? This um, would be uh, where the M line is, but we're not really talking about, we're not looking at a whole sarcomere here, we're just looking at these proteins for right now. So I have a quick question. All right, go for it. Is the H zone the same thing as the M line? Great question. What's so the M line yeah. stays the same, so the M line is always there. It's just it's just a static thing. It's a it's a place where the thick filaments in red of this sarcomere meet in the middle of the sarcomere. Okay, so it's uh -huh. just, it's just a it's just a thing. Um, it's a it's like a physical it's a physical place. The H yeah. zone is more like a it's a region that we describe um, based on whether a muscle is relaxed or contracted. So basically, mm. when a muscle is relaxed, these thin filaments would be like farther out and not overlapping with the thick filaments as much. And then the H zone would be much bigger. Okay. Does that make sense? When the yeah, muscle yeah, yeah, contracts, yeah. those thin filaments overlap the thick ones and they get closer together. And the H zone gets smaller as that overlapping happens right here so the so it's just the size but the m line never changes size it's just okay sitting. it's just a thing. so the zone is just the uh, um like length between the filaments yeah it's just a it's just like it's a region it's just a regional thing um it's kind mm -hmm. of the, we have kind of the same deal with the i band um the a band is going to stay the same because these thick filaments they don't really um they don't they don't move they're the ones that are stationary right so they're the ones that are just kind of sitting there it's these thin filaments that do the moving. It's the thin filaments that, oh, that do the overlapping. So they're the only ones that are actually moving. So when the overlapping is happening, when there's a muscle contraction happening and the thin filaments are overlapping with the thick filaments, the I band also will get smaller. Mm -hmm. So the, and the H band will get smaller as well. And then when it relaxes, the H band gets bigger and the I band is going to get bigger too, because these thin filaments are going to be overlapping with the red thick filaments less, right? Yeah. So they'll basically like back off um, from every direction, which seems really weird. Um, but again, I'll show you guys a video and it'll make a little bit more sense, I think, after that. 
helpful. Thank you. Professor, you said um, when the muscles relax, they get bigger? Or con yeah, when the muscle is relaxed, the H zone is going to be bigger because basically what you're seeing, it's like what you're seeing right here now, um, this is pretty much like as contracted as you can really get. Like these are super overlapping, right? The little thin filaments are overlapping with the thick filaments pretty much as far as they can go without hitting that M line, right? So if they're overlapped this much, then you have a fully contracted muscle. When the muscle relaxes, they, um, they, they, uh, they pull away from the red thick filament um, and don't overlap as much. So like this would be relaxed and this would be contracted. And since um, the thin filaments are moving, they'll be moving away from each other as the muscle relaxes, this H zone is going to get bigger. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> and then the same thing with the I band. As these, as these blue thin filaments sort of pull away from the thick red filaments, and from this side too, they're gonna like pull away from here, this I band is going to get bigger. You're gonna see less of that thick filament, more basically more of the thin filament is gonna be exposed as it like backs off from the thick filament on both sides. Does that make sense, sort of? So the I band will get bigger during muscle relaxation and the H zone gets bigger during muscle relaxation. During muscle contraction, they're gonna get smaller because the little thin filaments are going to be overlapping with the thick filaments more, leaving less of the just thin filaments to make that lighter colored I band. Does that make sense? Eh. <laughs> Did I lose you? <laughs> Gone over sarcomeres, one sarcomere from one zetus to another. Yes, it is. One sarcomere is from Z disc to Z disc right there. So this is one sarcomere right here. Okay. Did I lose you guys or are you there and just, just numb? Just numb. We're here, just numb processing. We're here. Yeah, we're here. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> I know it's weird and crazy. It's really neat though. And once we get through this and um, once it clicks, um, the rest of muscular system is, is um, it's pretty, it's, I feel like it's pretty chill, especially compared to the skeletal system. So I have a quick question. Yeah, go for it. Is, is every muscle like this? Oh yeah. Okay, oh, so every single muscle. Skeletal muscle. The, okay. um, your cardiac muscles um, may work a little bit similarly with some um, differences mm. in terms of like what the muscle cells actually look like. But all of your uh -huh. skeletal muscles, all of the muscles that you have mental control over, voluntary control mm -hmm. over, this is how they work. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Which is, which is really crazy the more you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> right? It is. So, it is. It is. It's really weird. So the, so the thick filaments, are, they look kind of fluffy, right? They've got these like really weird like structures on them, um, which is part of the reason why they um, why they look thicker and they create that darker a band what these funny little structures on them are called are called myosin heads so myosin is the type of protein that the thick filaments are made of okay um so um yeah so myosin is for the thick filaments okay that's the name of the protein that thick filaments are made of is myosin Myosin or thick filaments are bundles of thinner, um, thinner little subunits, a myosin actual like physical molecule, one single myosin molecule has a tail and a, uh, a pair of heads, okay? So the thick filament is a bundle of myosin molecules with all of their tails together and all of their heads sticking out. Okay, the thin filaments are made of a different type of protein called actin. Okay, so these little blue beads, looks like a string of pearls, a twisted string of pearls. Um, and the, each pearl is an actin subunit. So each one of these is a little protein um, 
little protein subunit. So they are kind of like a, like a double string of pearls twisted together. In addition to the actin forming the main um, string of the thin filament, you also have some other proteins, important proteins as well, and they are called troponin and tropomyosin, okay? So the tropomyosin looks like spaghetti sort of intertwined with the actin subunits of the thin filament, okay? So the tropomyosin is like this spaghetti, these little browny orangish strings. And troponin are these little yellow blobs. And the little yellow blobs, if you look closely, are covering up those little, um, actually the, all of it, the tropomyosin and the troponin are covering up these dark spots on the actin subunits. Whoops. Okay, so these, these little dark spots on the actin, they are the, um, like the active sites or the binding sites for these proteins, okay, which is super important. And it's really important that you know that the tropomyosin is covering all of those little active sites on the actin in the thin filament on a muscle, in a muscle at rest, okay? So when the muscle is resting and relaxed, you have the tropomyosin and the troponin covering up the active sites on the actin subunits of the thin filaments, okay? Um, so basically, nothing is happening when it is in this state. All of those little active, those little active sites on the actin, um, when they're blocked, nothing's happening, okay? Uh, what muscle contraction is, is what happens when those sites become unblocked and all hell breaks loose. It's crazy. Just kidding. It's not that crazy. Okay, let's talk about, oh, so this is basically what I just said. So myosin is the protein for the thick filaments. Um, it has, uh, it's a, basically a bundle of tails, of myosin uh, molecule tails that are interwoven. Um, and then it's got each, each one of these uh, myosin molecules has two heads. They're called the myosin heads, okay? You don't have to worry about um, what they're actually made of. Just know that they are myosin molecules, which is a protein, um, and that the myosin heads have binding sites for those actin subunits of the thin filaments, okay? It also has binding sites for ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. So the ATP binding to the myosin is going to be where the energy, where your cellular energy is actually being put to work to make your muscles contract, okay? And we're gonna talk about how that happens. The thin filaments are made of actin, which is a, just a different type of protein, okay? Um, they are a double strand. Instead of being a big old bundle like the myosin, it's, a, it's like a little, two little strings of pearls twisted together, okay? Um, those little strings of pearls are the actin, and the pearls are the actin subunits, right? So don't worry about the G and F and whatever. Just, it's protein, it's called actin. The actin subunits have the active sites which bind to the myosin heads, okay? During muscle contraction. And then the last parts are the tropomyosin and the troponin, which are the brown string, the spaghetti, the whole wheat spaghetti, <laughs> and the little yellow blobs are the troponin. And those guys are uh, regulatory proteins. They're proteins that bind to actin. Um, and when a muscle is at rest, they are blocking the active sites on the actin subunits, okay? Here's another picture. This time, see again, you, the, you can't count on the colors to memorize these things, right? The actin is going to be the two strings of pearls. In this picture, they are yellow. We still have the um, whole wheat spaghetti um, <laughs> being the tropomyosin and little blue blobs for the troponin this time. But you can see the tropomyosin, the troponin are blocking those active sites on the actin, right? So this is, a, this is at rest. 
And then on the thick filament, we've got a myosin molecule with its tail and its two heads. And you can see how they are all bundled together to form the thick filament. Here is where that M line is going to be, right? So of those, all those thick filaments lined up down the center of the sarcomere, this is where the M line would be down the center of the sarcomere. Okay, oops, okay. All right, let me show you a picture of that again real quick, right? So this is where the M line would be, thick filaments of myosin, thin filaments of actin. These guys are all fully overlapped. Here's that M line. So again, here's the M line, where is the, which is the middle of those thick filaments made of myosin and the thin filaments made of actin meet at the Z disc on either edge of the sarcomere, okay? All right, bear with me. We're gonna introduce a couple more characters and then we're going to see how this all works together. So like I said, muscle cells are weird. Um, they're so super hyper specialized, right? They do have, they've got multi, multiple nuclei, which is not terribly weird for a body cell. There are cells that are multinucleated. Um, they have lots and lots of mitochondria, which it should not come as a surprise since these are, um, this is a tissue that requires a lot of energy, right? And cellular respiration happens in the mitochondria. They are the powerhouses of the cell. So you have to have lots and lots of mitochondria to create lots and lots of ATP so that we can contract our muscles, right? Um, and then the weirdest part possibly is that it's full of these, that every muscle cell is full of these microfibrils, right? Um, which are these, which are the sarcomeres all lined up, which are made of these proteins, myosin and actin. In addition, another specialized, another way that muscle cells are different and special is that their endoplasmic reticulum has been, um, it's been like commandeered for a super specific purpose. So um, it, uh, it may play a role as an endoplasmic reticulum normally, but how, how we're going to focus on it today is its role in muscle contraction um, because it's a part of muscle cell. It has a special name because it's in a muscle cell and it's super specialized. That name is the sarcoplasmic reticulum, right? So instead of endo, it's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, you might see it abbreviated as SR, okay? The sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is uh, considered to be a smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it surrounds every myofibril within the muscle cell, okay? So if we look at um, this muscle cell, okay, uh, this whole thing actually right here, right? And each individual myofibril within that cell is covered by this sarcoplasmic reticulum in blue. Kind of looks like a weird like spider web going on here in blue around each and every one of these myofibrils, right? Which is where those sarcomeres are located. Um, the sarcoplasmic reticulum uh, has uh, these things called terminal cisternae, which is plural, um, cis uh, a cistern, I think, is this would be the singular form, but cisternae is plural. Um, which form perpendicular cross channels. So you've got our, um, the terminal cisternae here forming um, cross channels going both horizontally along the length of this muscle uh, myofibril. And then you've also got it going um, basically perpendicular to that as well. So um, at this point, you also have what is called, pardon me, Oh, not getting the T-tubules yet. So we also have the T-tubules, which is this lighter blue color here. We'll talk about those in a second. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is blue, and it's covering every one of these myofibrils, its purpose is to store calcium, okay? They are calcium cisterns. They are calcium reservoirs, okay? They basically hold the calcium um, and when the calcium is needed, which is when you are going to contract your muscles, it releases that calcium into the myofibril. And that is like the trigger for your muscles to contract, which seems really weird, but it's true. 
the T tubules, which again are these lighter blue cover, uh, lighter blue tubes here. Um, they are associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, because they are um, they're attached to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and they are continuous with the plasma membrane of the muscle cell, which you'll recall is termed the sarcolemma, right? So the sarcolemma is just fancy word for the plasma membrane of a muscle cell. These T tubules are continuous with the sarcolemma, and there's a really important reason for that. Um, in addition, so, so I'll get to that in a second. The sarcolemma, the plasma membrane of the, of the cell, right, or the covering of the uh, muscle cell, is continuous with these T tubules, and the T tubules dive down into the center of each of these myofibrils. So it penetrates down into every muscle cell at the I band, at the A band, I band junction. So wherever you have that first, uh, that basically like the edge of the thick filaments for that A band where that dark stripe is, like the edge of that dark stripe, and then the th thin filaments are over here you're going to have a T-tubule that is going to basically be passing by right there. The T-tubules are also associated with those terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that encircle each and every sarcomere. Okay, so here's the sarcoplasmic reticulum encircling the sarcomere of this myofibril. Here's the T-tubules, which are associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum and are also continuous with the sarcolemma, okay? So they're continuous with this plasma membrane right here. You can see like the little, the little openings here on the T-tubule where it talks to the sarcolemma. Okay. All right. The relationship between the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the T-tubules is what is called a triad, okay? So triad is in three, um, so you have two terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and one T-tubule in every triad, okay? The T-tubules are basically going to be where the, where the action potential, where the electrochemical signal from the nerve is going to go from the outside of the cell all the way deep into the myofibril to reach every single sarcomere, okay? So in order for your muscle to all contract all at the same time, that nerve impulse from that one nerve that feeds that whole muscle has to go, has to branch off to every single muscle cell. And then in every single muscle cell, it needs to talk to every single myofibril and the way that it gets inside of those myofibrils is the T-tubule. So you have to get that nerve impulse all the way from the outside of the muscle entirely to each muscle cell and then to each myofibril. And then the T-tubules are gonna take that signal and push it all the way into every single, to everything, every single sarcomere, okay? So the T-tubules are the way that that nerve impulse makes it all the way into the deepest parts of your muscle so that your entire muscle can contract all at the same time, okay? The, don't worry about these, the proteins or how exactly it does that. Um, that's as much as I really want you to know about that. So the T-tubules are gonna take that signal down and they, that, that signal, what it actually does is it notifies the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the calcium, okay? So it's basically just telling it to open the gates and, release, and basically flood the myofibrils and all of its sarcomeres with calcium ions, okay? So the T-tubules conduct impulses deep into the muscle fiber and the gated channels of the sarcoplasmic reticulum are going to uh, open um, on that command from the T-tubules and release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcomeres, okay? Deep inside of those myofibrils. So the muscle contraction itself is a generation of force, obviously, right? So after those calcium ions are released and they do what they do, which you'll see in the video in a second, um, 
the muscle, the myofibrils, so the sarcomeres are going to see overlap of the proteins of the thick and thin filaments. The myofibrils are going to get shorter, so the fascicles will get shorter, so your entire muscle will get shorter, and that all that force is a muscle contraction. So just because we have um, an impulse and we have contraction, or yeah, so just because we have contraction, which is considered a generation of force, doesn't necessarily mean that your muscle is going to shorten. I know that's what I just said, but consider this. When you pick something up that is relatively heavy, right? I'm not like, this muscle is tense, but it's not contracted like it would be like this, right? There's a difference between maintaining tension to hold an object up in the air and actively moving that, that object, right? We have so much control over our muscles that we are able to not just fling up and away everything that we hold in our hands and try to pick up, right? We have so much fine control that I can pick up this glass and hold it here in the air without flinging it over my shoulder, right? So just because I am generating force here, uh, this is still a, considered a contraction, even though it's not, even though I'm not shortening the muscle completely, it's still considered a, a muscle contraction because it's still a gener, it's, I'm still having to generate force in order to hold this up. Does that make sense? So just because I'm generating force here, there is tension here to hold an object up, up off of the surface does not mean that I necessarily have to make the muscle as short as possible. I can just sort of like hold that force at any given point, which is like really, really important, obviously, for us to have really super fine-tuned control over our muscles and what we do. So just know that muscle contraction doesn't necessarily mean like full flexion. It can mean just tension, right? So just like holding, just holding something in the air, that tension, you still require that those calcium ions and the ATP to do that, right? Even though you're not like fully contracting or fully shortening the muscle fibers. That's kind of a, it's kind of a side thing, more of a physics thing, but it's important for understanding how muscles work, okay? Okay. When, you, uh, when the tension um, exceeds the forces opposing shortening, you basically have a threshold where you go from here to here. You're basically saying, okay, we're activating the muscle, muscle is activated, and then you have to activate it a little bit further. You actually send a little bit more nerve impulses into the muscle to take it all the way, okay? Kind of a little, a bit of a physics lesson there. Okay, so let's talk about how this actually happens finally so we know all the characters, okay? So the thin and thick filaments in each of those sarcomeres, when your muscles are relaxed, they're only overlapping a little bit, right? During contraction, it is those funky little myosin heads on the thick filament that bind to the actin and then pull the actin over to overlap with the thick filament, okay? So the thin filaments and the thick filaments overlap to cause the muscle to shorten, okay? As the H zone, right, which is that little line between, oh, it's actually my next slide, so I should have just stayed there. This, when this H zone uh, is getting shorter, that means that those actin filaments, the thin filaments, are coming closer towards each other, towards the M line, right? So this H zone gets shorter as those thin filaments come in closer to each other, right? So as muscle contraction actually occurs, the H zone is going to get smaller. So here's the H zone in a relaxed muscle versus in a um, fully, fully contracted muscle, right? It's basically gone. H zone relaxed, H zone pretty much gone. 
this is the z-band this is the z-band in this actual like micrograph of an actual muscle um myofibril z uh, z uh, z disc z disc so this is the whole sarcomere see how much shorter it got when the muscle contracted right from out here to in here, from out here to in here. So the entire sarcomere shortened as well. The H zone basically disappeared. And the I bands also got very short, right? They didn't quite disappear, but they got much shorter. The I bands are the light stripes, right? So those light stripes are gonna get shorter too because the thick filaments are overlapping with the thin filaments right, as the thin filaments get pulled in towards the M line. So basically that dark band of the A band is going to, it's going to stay the same, but it's going to basically absorb all of those little thin filaments as they come in to overlap with the thick filaments, okay? So this is a relaxed muscle, this is a contracted muscle, and we can see how the various regions um, change between a relaxed and a contracted state. The H, the H zone disappears almost entirely, gets smaller. The I bands get smaller. The M, or sorry, the A band is going to stay the same because the actual thick filaments don't actually, these guys don't actually change in length, right? Nothing is actually changing. Um, the actual physical structures are not changing in length, right? We're just talking about like these regions and the sarcomere itself changing in length, but these proteins are just overlapping. They're not like getting shorter and longer, they're just overlapping. Does that make sense, you guys? How the, what happens to the M line and the Z disc and the A and I bands and the H zone? <laughs> what happens to those guys during muscle contraction? Yeah, it makes sense. Sort of? Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah, it makes sense. Excellent. Let's go watch my delightful YouTube video. I forgot to pull it up, so I'll just find it. Go away, Zoom. You always got to be in my way. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm pretty sure this is narrated and if I mute it or if I mute my computer, I'm not sure that you're gonna be able to hear me. Let me try this actually. Can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, but I can't hear you, that's the problem. Okay, <laughs> so that's the deal. Okay, so I'm assuming that you can hear me, but, um, but you can't maybe, but you can't hear the video. So I can, I'm going to narrate the video for you guys. <clears throat> okay. So this whole situation with the, um, the thick filaments and the thin filaments overlapping and the sarcomeres shortening, that is called the cross bridge cycle, or it happens thanks to the cross bridge cycle, okay? All right, this is so cool, okay. Oh, do I envy you seeing this for the first time? I'm just kidding, I'm being ridiculous, all right, <laughs> okay. So here's your muscle, muscle contraction. <clears throat> we know what that is, what it means, but how does it actually happen? We have to <clears throat> look at a microscopic level at each of these muscle cells and these myofibrils, which are made up of sarcomeres, okay? So this is all the muscle cell. We zoom into one sarcomere of one myofibril. We can see the thick filaments <clears throat> in pink and the thin filaments in yellow, okay? And it's showing them uh, overlapping. So here again is the thin filament in yellow and the thick filament in pink. Here's the myosin head. And the myosin head is going to interact with the actin because calcium pulls the tropomyosin it binds to the troponin, which pulls the tropomyosin away from those binding sites, those active sites on the actin. Once that happens, the myosin head can attach to the actin binding site, and it's going to use ATP 
to pull that thin filament along. And with those two little myosin heads, it sort of walks along the thin filament of actin, which is so creepy and so cool, and I love it. So <clears throat> specifically, the ATP is used to, um, to allow the myosin head to detach. Um, and it is basically utilizing the ATP, uh, turning ATP into ADP, right? Removing a phosphate which causes the myosin head to both cock, attach, and pull, okay? So we saw the ATP cocking the head of the myosin. Step two, power stroke. Step three, we need a new ATP molecule to come and detach that myosin head from the actin filament. So here comes our new ATP to detach the myosin head, and then it's going to cock and be ready to go again. And then we get to see it walk in all creepy, pulling the thin filament along. I'm not interested in you guys knowing like this, the, those four steps. Just check out how the myosin head are working together to pull the actin along, which causes the thick filaments and the thin filaments to overlap. Any second now, there they go. Look at that, they're pulling, they're pulling. The entire sarcomere is getting smaller, it gets smaller. And then the sarcoplasmic reticulum reabsorbs all those calcium ions. And when there's no more calcium ions, so the little purple dots are all the calcium ions. Once they are all gone and get re, we get put back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the troponin pulls the tropomyosin back over those binding sites. Myosin can no longer bind to actin and the muscle relaxes. Okay, let me turn this back on so that I can hear you guys in case you want to. see it again or have questions? I think I can hear you now. Does it make a little bit more sense after that? I'm going to, I'll link that video yeah. in Canvas as well. Yes. Cool. So yeah. I have a question. The, yeah. the thick filaments never really move. Do they move at all? Exactly. No, they don't. They so don't. Okay. Yeah, yeah, no. That's what's so. That's what's wild. so cool and weird about it. Yeah, it's it's really yeah. it's really wild. Actually, the sarcomere. Hang on. Oh, I can hear that. No. I know. I don't want to. I don't want you to hear it. Oh. oh. So <laughs> I want to mute it. A sarcomere <laughs> shortens when myosin heads oh, and thick is. myofilaments form cross bridges with. Ac that's fine. It's actually a it's actually a really good narration. I just get too excited, but it's like just the uh, so you can see how the thick filaments. Clear on my screen. There you go. So the thick filaments, they just sit there. They basically just sit there, and the myosin heads are moving to pull the thin filaments over. So they're basically just pulling the Z discs closer to each other. Does that make sense? So it's just the head that moves. It's just the little heads that are right. moving. Yeah. yeah. The only parts of the thick filament of the myosin that are actually moving is the little, the little heads doing this. And the coolest part about it to me, because I'm morbid, is that so the calcium are these little are the little purple guys, right? So they get released from the sarcomere yeah. reticulum, right? So the the so the the nerve impulse hits the muscle, it uh, hits all those T tubules in every single myofibril, right? The T tubules send the signal down past the sarcomeres and tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is covering all these myofibrils to release calcium into the center of the, micro, of, the, of the myofibril, right? Into where the sarcomeres are. When all of that calcium floods into the sarcomeres, it binds to the troponin, which are the little blobs on the actin, which are holding the tropomyosin over the binding sites on the actin, right? So that calcium activates the tropomyosin, sorry, activates the troponin, which pulls the tropomyosin away, 
from the binding sites. And once those binding sites are open, the myosin heads on the thick filament bind to it and pull. After it pulls, you have to have ATP come and tell that myosin head to detach. When you're dead, you not, you're not making any ATP anymore, right? Because you're dead. So yeah. when you die, <laughs> all of your little myosin heads and all of your muscles get locked onto whatever position they were in when you died, right? Which is rigor mortis. How weird. It's rigor mortis. No, I like yeah, that's how rigor mortis works. Isn't that crazy? I love that. It's so wow. nice. Without the ATP, yeah. the myosin heads can't detach. So they're just pulling. They're just so they just stay there forever. They just stay there forever. Yeah. Until you until die. You, until you until you start decomposing and then <laughs> but, oh man, it's just so cool. That's wild. Oh, I know, it's a trip, right? So yeah. um this whole like the end of the axon, um, end of the nerve, the nerve fiber thing. It's gonna come up again when we talk about special senses. Um, so I'll probably go into more detail when we go into special senses about like how the actual like nerve impulse works. Um, but I thought this was a pretty good like summation of what's happening um, just for like the, just for our muscle tissue talk. So basically, um, the nerve impulse travels down, remember the axon of the neuron, right? So the neuron is a little star-shaped cell. And it's got dendrites, which are all the little short arms all around the body of the cell. And then one long tail, right? And that one long tail is called the axon. So this is basically the end of the axon for a motor neuron. And a motor neuron is just a neuron, a special neuron, or a neuron that is, um, positioned in a way that it receives a signal from the brain and passes it on to a muscle, right? This is why our muscles are voluntary is because of these motor neurons. We can tell our muscles what to do through motor neurons. At the end of the axon of this motor neuron, you have what are called the um, neuromuscular junction. So basically you have these, um, all these little strands or branches one more time um, and we call the very, very ends of those the axon terminals, okay? So this whole thing is the axon. They terminate, it terminates in axon terminals. And the gap in between the end, the end of that axon terminal and the sarcolemma of the muscle cell is called the neuromuscular junction. And it is at that neuromuscular junction in that little gap that the actual like chemical electrochemical signal jumps between the axon of that motor neuron to the sarcolemma of the muscle cell and that signal is what then penetrates into the cell into all those myofibrils down the t-tubules to tell the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium okay so uh, just know that this is going to be um this is based, so basically, I want you to know the neuromuscular junction is basically the um, where the um, the axon terminals meet the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. Okay, so the axon terminal of the neuron, the end of the neuron, touches the plasma membrane of the muscle cell at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, and we'll talk more about how that actual like how that nerve impulse, how that action potential, what we call it, um, gets sent along the neuron when we talk about special senses. And it has to do with the, um, with that, um, the, the ion, so the electrical gradient between the inside and outside of the neuron itself, between the plasma membrane, where we talked about like chemical gradients, um, diffusion down a gradient, and then you also have like um, energy potential, so like positive and negative ions on either side of a plasma membrane causing a gradient, an electrical gradient, that's how that signal is passed down. The, um, the entire, all of the neurons from your brain all the way down to whatever muscle you're activating um, to get to the muscle to tell it what to do, basically. And the last thing, I'm gonna, I want to answer all of your guys' questions. This is my last slide, though. Um, I thought it was a good so kind of a um, last little summary overview of what's happening with muscle contraction from three different views. 
uh, a relaxed muscle, just to recap, um, none of these um, protein filaments in any either of these sarcomeres. We've got two little sarcomeres going on here, right? So we've got in this sarcomere our little thick filaments of myosin, our little M line, and our thin filaments of actin. Same thing over here, our little myosin filaments, our M line, and our thin filaments of actin are all relatively not very overlapped, right? The I band is nice and big. The H zone is, is relatively large, right? Because these thin filaments are far apart from each other and not overlapping the thick filaments. Uh, and then the A band is the A band. It is because it's where the thick filaments are. And let's see, Z disc, Z disc, M line. What am I missing? H zone, A and I bands, okay. So during muscle contraction, if you're going to partially contract the muscle, it still counts. You still have to use calcium and ATP to just do this, right? Versus like doing the full on muscle contraction, just maintaining tension requires that as well. Even in that partially contracted muscle, you're going to have a little bit of movement. You're going to have the H zone getting smaller, because these thin filaments are moving closer together, right? They were over here, and now they are, they're over here, not overlapping very much, and then overlapping a little bit more right here. And the I band got a little bit smaller too, right? Because we are basically like pulling those uh, myosin, the, you're basically pulling, it's like you're pulling the A lines of two adjacent sarcomeres closer to each other is how the I, the I band gets smaller, right? So like this thick filament from this sarcomere is getting closer to the thick filament from this sarcomere because you have more overlap happening here than you do right here. And then in a fully contracted muscle, as contracted as it can possibly be, that H zone completely disappears so these little thin filaments are basically touching at the M line now. And the I band has all but disappeared as well. And now these thick filaments are like right up next to each other at the Z disc, right? Whereas you could have, you had a little bit of that, of the thin filaments sort of um, forming that, that, um, that lighter colored I band before. And now it's been like pretty much um, taken up by the A band, if you will. So even in a real picture photograph of a muscle fiber, you can see, so you can see the H zone getting, getting smaller and disappearing and the I band getting smaller and getting smaller. The sarcomere itself from Z disc to, to Z disc, from Z disc to Z disc also getting a little bit smaller and getting a little bit smaller. And if every single sarcomere gets that much smaller, and every single myofibril from end to end will get that much smaller. That means that your muscle goes from very long when relaxed to pretty darn short when fully contracted. And that's how you generate that energy. And it's crazy and there's a lot of different words and names for things that are all the different parts of it. Um, but that's it in a nutshell. And that's what I want to leave you with today, even though it was relatively short. I probably talked way too fast, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when you replay this on YouTube, I think you can slow it down. Um, but, uh, if you have any questions, let me know, but I, I'm also gonna come back at 5.30 anyway, um, so that you guys get a chance to maybe go with something to eat, go meditate, take a little nap, um, let this sink in a little bit. Uh, and then if you, have, if, you can, if you think of questions, you can come back with them um, and we can go through this again. Um, whichever parts or whatever you want. Let's see, did I say the myosin heads are attached to the thick filaments? Indeed. And the two filaments, thick and thin, are pulling together is what causes contractions. Indeed. So the myosin heads are part of the thick myosin filaments and the thick and, and the thick Filaments, filaments um, are pulling the thin filaments um, 
so that they overlap, causing the muscle to, which is colloquially known as a muscle contraction. Okay, so what else, you guys? Can you think of any questions for this right now, or should I just? I have a question regarding yeah. this. Yeah. Um, where are the YouTube videos for the lectures? Is it? Oh, yeah. So the I've been uploading them. Oh, this makes me sad. All right, I've been uploading them uh, onto our Canvas. So if you just go to the home page, um, let's see. We started doing this around histology. If this will ever load, then I will show you. Okay, here we go. I'll look online. Yeah, so I've got them basically as links um, to YouTube videos. So for every um, for every lecture, I think I end up like just calling these lectures. Yeah, like I just put lecture and lab together. Um, since I'm sort of is that on the home page? Huh? Is that on the home page? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So okay. each module is okay, for so it's just right there basically for every every chapter but um yeah i've got them i've got them as links so they're not like as actual like mp4s they're not embedded into canvas they're mm. just links out to youtube um and i don't have the youtube i don't have them um public they're not supposed to be public because you guys are yeah. sign a contract to have your images and voices <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. be out on youtube so they're unlisted so the only i think the only way you can get to them is is through this, these links um, I guess if you, I, I'm pretty sure if you bookmarked the YouTube page, I have like my channel or whatever in all of our videos yeah, out there. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure if you can do that. I think, I don't know if you have to have a link specifically to get to them, um, or if you can bookmark like our little, our page, our YouTube um, channel. I'm not sure if you'll be able to do that. But um, since it's mine, I can't really, I guess I could log out and find out if that's possible. But um, yeah, they're all they're all in the, in the modules on the homepage. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And I'll upload this one as soon as I can. But as you've seen, I'm sure uh, it does take me a couple hours. It has to like convert into MP4, and then I have to upload it to YouTube, and then YouTube has to do their whole thing, make sure there's nothing obscene on it, and then <laughs> let me link it. So it takes it takes a, it takes a bit. No, so the labs for this week, I haven't uploaded anything for muscular system yet um, because uh, your guys' uh, exams last week were um, tedious and um, possibly, um, uh, I don't want to say crushing, that seems like a strong word, but I know you guys are probably exhausted after that. I'm not assigning anything until Thursday, um, but it'll be out of the human body coloring book. Um, and uh, there isn't anything specifically for this for the microscopic muscle like the muscle physiology stuff this lecture would have been like an actual lecture lecture um if we didn't have the whole coronavirus thing so um this isn't it wasn't it wouldn't have been a lab thing the real lab stuff that i'm going to be assigning coloring book pages for is the um muscle identification um so we will get to that on Thursday. That's the plan. Uh, any other questions? Okay. I'm going to come back at 530 and I will be here in case you think of anything um, question wise. Oh, quick question. Yep, that's all it is. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, the, I'm using our lab time to basically lecture about everything that we would have covered in lecture and lab. Um, since I can't like be there for you guys for like a physical looking at models kind of thing or to do an actual like lab in class lab assignment. Um, yeah, I'm just lecturing for as long as I need to lecture during our lab time, which was two to five, two to five. And then the actual lecture time, which was 5.30 to 6.30, we're just, it's basically like office hours. Yeah, that's how, that's how we're doing it, so. <laughs> okay, we good?
All right, you guys. Then I yes. will see you at 5.30 if you guys have questions. Um, and if not, then I will see you on Thursday. And don't panic about not seeing anything assigned for the lab um, yet. Um, I'll double check the due dates for that. I'm pretty sure I don't have them due until like the muscular system exam, like way out there. So don't panic, relax, see if you can sort of absorb this information um, and take a little break, give yourselves a little break um, before Thursday and we start talking about our wonderful muscular system and all the muscles in it, okay? All right, I'm going to stop recording now. Goodbye.